Well, I, I grew up and live in South Louisiana, right outside of New Orleans, a small agency, well, uh, an agency of about 450 people in, in the New Orleans metro area. Uh, I went to work for my agency in 1984 and did 35 years uh, through pretty much every division in the, uh, in the department. We're uh, kind of a unique agency, uh, at least for Louisiana, in that we are the sole law enforcement agency. There are no municipalities, so the sheriff's office is the sole jurisdiction for my agency. Uh, I've worked there for, for a number of years, worked through detectives, patrol. Even the best job I ever had was a resource officer. Uh, for the last 20 years, I commanded the uh, uh, Special Services Division, which had all of the outreach programs, public information, public relations, and a number of other programs uh, bundled into one. Well, you know, when I first started, uh, we had an FOP lodge. It was a small lodge. My agency was much smaller back then, uh, back in 1984. And uh, so it was a person that was in charge of training. His name was Richard Benoit. Uh, Richard, a uh, very, very dear friend for years. He was one of my mentors. But I uh, went through training, uh, got my, picked up all my equipment when I started on a job. And he, he didn't ask me. He told me that I, I had a meeting to go to. So that was my very first FOP meeting. And uh, just immediately from that first day, I uh, became involved and uh, just never stopped. I, I don't know if I truly grasped the whole FOP concept at that time, but I became president of my local lodge and, and focused on local lodge issues. I, I really, if it was outside of our jurisdiction, I really didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. It was, you know, trying to deal with those important issues for, you know, trying to build stability for our lodge, trying to build stability for our profession, and uh, in, in, in talking about some, you know, some important issues within our community and trying to be part of it. Uh, trying to blend that in with the department, trying to build that correct atmosphere uh, where the public respected and understood who we were and, and had their support. So for years, that's all I did. Uh, I was the president probably a good four or five years in my local lodge before I really ventured outside of my local lodge. Uh, my, national, my state trustee came to me one day, said he couldn't make it to a state board meeting. I'd been to state conferences, so I, I understood, you know, what happened there. But uh, he told me he couldn't make a meeting and asked me if I'd fill in for him. And I went to that trustees meeting and, and some of the discussions that were there, I just, uh, I, I guess a little, little concerned because I knew that we were fighting with some really important issues statewide on some of our, our pay issues and uh, didn't find that they were really talking much about them. Uh, so I, at that point, spoke up at the meeting and the next thing I knew I was very much engaged and it didn't take very long after that before I became a board member and then ultimately served uh, 10 years as the Louisiana State President. So, you know, it's a dream. Uh, I've been involved on a state, local and national level for years and was on a national board for 16, almost 17 years now. Started off as Sergeant at Arms. I was National Secretary for just over uh, 14 years. And uh, best job I ever had in FOP. I loved it. I, you know, I had a great staff that became my family. Uh, felt like I was doing some great things, helping. You know, there's a lot of things. We're all running different directions and trying to manage an FOP lodge and represent our members at the same time we're working and trying to work details and try and raise our family and life. Life happens. And I, I always looked at it as our ability with a, with a great staff to personalize the service we did, make their jobs easier, and whatever we could do to make their jobs easier gave them the opportunity to focus their, their energy on the more important things, that, which was their members. And uh, so I, I really loved that, that role. Uh, but the opportunity came, you know, like anyone, there's some, some goals and desires that you'd like to see us as an organization do. And, and uh, when the opportunity presented itself, uh, you know, I took advantage of it. It, was a, it wasn't an easy one for me to make because I'd been so close to, to my staff for, for all that time. Yeah, you know, it's like Nashville was my second home where our national headquarters is. And for, in some ways, I felt like I was leaving my family. But I also recognized that, uh, you know, at, at some point, if you, if you have some desires and things that you want, you either need to quit talking about them and do something about it, or you own the fact that you never did, uh, you never did try and elevate the organization. So any opportunity presented itself, I ran for president. And uh, I tell you, what a, uh, what a great, uh, awesome, and amazing, uh, you know, just experience to get to this point. But I will tell you one thing, I didn't get here alone. I did not get here alone. I got here because I got here on the backs of a whole lot of people that believed in me for all these years. Uh, I, I tell people that at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's not the quality of service we provide, not that that's not important. It's not the products we provide, not that that's not important. At the end of the day, it really is all about those relationships. And for 16 years on the national board, I've been building those relationships across this country, uh, one, one member at a time. And, uh, 
it gave me the opportunity to become the national president. So I am, uh, I, I could not be prouder. No, I, uh, you know, look, I always uh, wanted to, to, to be involved in the FOP because this kind of is my life. You know, you take paths in life. Uh, you know, I think we all had a certain vision. We'd be at something one day, whether it be law enforcement or moving into the private sector at some point. I think all of us have those visions one day. And I, so I think I'm no different than anyone else what's life after law enforcement. Uh, and then somewhere along the way, I, I became a national board member. It kind of changed my life and it, it changed my direction. So for me, I was, you know, just very much, uh, very much loved uh, the, whole, the whole concept of representing our members. and and trying to do some, some positive things in our communities, trying to do positive things for our member, try, members, trying to, to build stability in our profession. You know, it's a, it's a web. It's a web that uh, has a lot of different, different parts to it. And, uh, you know, I just, it, I, I truly enjoyed and loved that part of it. And because of that, you know, I, life without FOP was, a, was not something that really made a whole lot of sense to me. So it's a path that I chose to go down. I truly loved being secretary. Uh, I was very content with that job. Uh, but I think it just came a point where in our organization that I, I think our whole profession is in transition. And I felt like I had some ideas and some suggestions and some, some, some uh, energy to provide in changing that direction. And uh, in sort of, in my opinion, redefining law enforcement. This nation's changing, this world's changing. Uh, we, we need to change to some extent with it. And we need to find that happy medium. And uh, so I, I came forward with a, with a list of ideas and went across this country selling a vision that the majority of members saw and bought into it. And uh, we wasted no time rolling right into those things and, and making some good things happen for our members. I see my role is not so much the things we can do as me as a president. I see my role more of, of how can I pull everybody together because there's no shortage of leaders in our organization and people that want to do some great things and great ideas. And we are a law enforcement profession. Uh, and, and so with that, uh, so the time commitment becomes more of what's, what's my role? Well, my role is to make sure that I unite everybody and we use that energy for positive rather than negative. We need to affect some change, but at the same time, we need to defend officers' rights because this is a strange time in our profession. You know, we've got, uh, we got, we're under attack. We went from public servants to public enemies overnight. And uh, we do this because there are a great deal of people who have made a living off of the dissension they were able to create between us and them. And that's exactly what they've done. They've created an atmosphere where there's a belief that there's us and there's them. The them is the community. The us is the law enforcement profession. And they've decided to do that because they wanted to dehumanize who we are. So what the us is the people who live in your communities. The us are the people that send our same kids to the schools. The us are the people that put their lives on the line in your community every day and make a difference. And so my goal is to keep everybody moving in that positive direction and at the same time changing that narrative that it's us against them. We're all in this together. We need to build relationships in every one of our communities. But they need to view us as much, very much interested in the same exact things that they want. None of us are responsible for failing school systems or poverty or all the things that create hopelessness in, in communities. But you know what, as a law enforcement officer, as a leader in our communities, yeah, I think it's our job to now start weighing into those areas and start seeing if we can have an impact on trying to improve the quality of life in every one of our communities. And that's the only way we're going to change this image between us and them. Well, I think it's, it's, it has to be society's, the culture in society now, the, the level of hatred in this country. Uh, you know, we can, we can blame it on a number of things. We can blame it on social media. It gives people the ability to be able to voice their concerns with a little bit of anonymity that elevates it. But I think it goes much farther than that. I think uh, our national politics plays a big role in this. And I think there are people who have created an entire career in creating conflict. And uh, so uh, if I say anything, it's the fact that some of the things that are happening in this country, at least as it relates to law enforcement, it just seems to defy logic. Like, for example, district attorneys that are deciding to, to uh, decriminalize crimes somehow is trying to, to come up with the belief that that's going to make our community safer. You know, anybody in law enforcement that's been around a little while knows about the broken window theory. Broken window theory is really a study that was done back in the 60s 
where if, if I just extrapolate it forward, it, it has to do with allowing decay. If you allow a little decay, then what it does is it encourages more. You can look at graffiti, you can look at a broken window in a factory. If you had a broken window in a factory and you allowed it, then it's likely that other people were going to break additional windows. And, and that's the whole theory, a broken window. I would argue with you that what we're seeing in this country right now is a is the 21st century broken window with district attorneys that are decriminalizing crimes and somehow thinking that a little decay is going to make our community safer. None of that makes any sense to us whatsoever. Not, it, it doesn't. It defies logic and what we're seeing is people who are, there's bad people out there. You know, we go out every day and we deal with a community. We, we, you know, we, we, the majority of people we deal with are, are, are good law-abiding citizens. But we also deal with a segment of society that's, that most people would like to think don't exist. If anybody's been in law enforcement for a little while, they know these people exist. And it's our job to keep them out of the lives of the people we serve. So there's some people who are repeat offenders that over and over and over, and by allowing them back on the street, we have, we've seen time and time and time and time and time and time again where innocent people are being hurt by people we've taken off the streets only to be released for them to go out and continue their violent sprees and victimize the people we serve. Tell me how that is helping our community strive. It doesn't. Well, I, like, I, think, I think we've already started that. Again, remember there are people who make a living off of creating that dissension. We're always going to have to, we're always going to have to deal with that segment of people. But what we can do is, I, I, probably the biggest thing we can do is a profession. Um, so we need to start having that dialogue. Remember that if people in a, in a community are frustrated, they are going to reach out and lash out at the very things that, that you know, they think caused it. Well, if you, look at, uh, if, you, if you look in a lot of communities, there are a whole lot of promises made to people. There's, a, there's hopeless, you know, whether it's good quality schools, whether, whatever it is. You know, they're living in communities where they're struggling. They see violence every day. It becomes a norm to them. Um, so, so they see things in a very different view than most everyone else does. Everything, you know, it, it's, it's their world that they live in. And I can just tell you that, that if we don't, as a, as a profession, start recognizing that there's a frustration there, these people are lashing out at the branch of government that's the closest to them. They may be frustrated about a whole bunch of things that we in law enforcement have never had any role in whatsoever, but what we are is the people, we are low-hanging fruit of a, of a, of a tree of failed, failed policies and, and promises. So we're getting a brunt from it because we're that authority that has to try and, and work and referee these conflicts within our communities. So what we need to do is, again, we've got to have a dialogue. The number one thing is we've got to start working within our communities. We need to get out, our, get out of our comfort zone and start listening to the people we serve. We need to have that dialogue with them. It's going to do two things. One, it's going to help us understand where they're coming from, but it also gives us an opportunity to explain why we do the things that we do. And the only thing that we can, you know, if we don't have that dialogue, then we have no chance of those, those two things happening. The other thing is, is we've got to start holding our public officials accountable. You know, it's, it's easy to say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote for so-and-so because so-and-so is a nice guy or so-and-so is, you know, she's a nice lady and she's going to do good or she's going to keep people out of jail. Well, that's all fine and good until it's your property that got stolen, until it's your family that got hurt or your child that got murdered. At some point, we've got to recognize that we all grew up knowing that there's a right and there's a wrong. And when there's a right and a wrong, even as kids, we taught that to our kids from the very first day. There's a right thing to do and a wrong thing to do. When you start graying that area in between them, it's harder for people to follow. And that's exactly what we find in our communities. So that's fine. You know, we could say we're going to decriminalize some of these, these things within our communities. But let me ask you a question. In cities where they said if you steal less than $750, we're not going to prosecute. If you're a small business that's trying to, just trying to make it, how many $750 thefts can you handle before you have to close your doors? So where are the victims? Who's ever talking about the victims when you start talking about this reform? Look, we're for reform. We want to have meaningful discussion on ways to improve the criminal justice system. The First Step Act is a perfect example of that. We sat at a table and came up with some solutions collectively with all the stakeholders. So we want to talk to people. We want to find, I would, personally, I would rather light a candle than curse the darkness. Rather than talking about what's wrong, Let's talk about some solutions to it. If all you're going to do is complain about what's wrong, well, shame on you. You're not helping resolve anything. But if you truly want to have a discussion and have a fact-based discussion about real issues and not ignore the real facts 
at least when it relates to law enforcement, we will sit at the table, talk with you, and try and find some solutions to make our community stronger, make our jobs and our community safer. Well, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to something that I'm pretty proud of. Um, you know, we talked about the tax issue that we passed. That was, a, that was the first thing that kind of gave me, see, you know what, our, our destiny is in our hands. You know, if, we're gonna, if something's going to happen, it's going to be because we come up with a strategy to do it. And our strategy to do it was a pretty sound one. It was based on some real information. You know, you can take some chances every now and then, or you can do your research. And you can come up with a plan, calculated plan that, you know, there's an old saying, Sung Su, you know, the one who will win is likely already won. And, and, and that really means is that when you do your homework and you do your research and you do exactly what you need and you follow the numbers to bring you based on some fact-based fact direction, then you have a much better chance of succeeding. So I'm very proud of that one. Another one would be is the way the Fraternal Order Police stepped up on uh, August 29th, 2005, when Hurricane Katrina devastated Louisiana. That was the Louisiana state president at the time. It's uh, right around 6,000 members in the state and one third of our members were homeless. On that Sunday night when Hurricane Katrina came in with floodwaters that flooded uh, over 2,000 of my members' homes and left them homeless. And what we did across this country, coming together to help our members in Louisiana, you know, of course there was a connection. We had just hosted a national conference. We had uh, around 6,000 of our closest friends come over for a week and spent time in New Orleans. And then less than three weeks later, they're watching the news, watching the very city that we're in. So they felt a connection to it. But they raised, you know, over a million dollars for us to be able to help our members get their lives back together. Not just us, Mississippi and Alabama. And so it's, it's people pulling together and helping us. We had people driving in and helping us. You know, we were struggling trying to, trying to get an infrastructure together, trying to get some network together and the whole, and the FOP stepped up and sent a whole bunch of people in and we went out and we made, we made a meaningful difference in the lives of the people in that city. And we were able to, to help stabilize. Uh, city. So you, you talk about a proudest moment, yeah, I, I have to look at that as one of them as well. On a national level, oh, there's a whole bunch. Uh, some of them might, seem, might not seem like much to you, but the memorial we built right at our national headquarters honoring five national officers who were killed in the line of duty, that's a pretty proud moment. The building of our national headquarters, finding the location, meeting with the architect, designing it in a building that everyone walks in and they're very impressed, it's our roots. Yeah, all of these things. There's so many things to point to that, that, that make me proud. But probably proudest is now I'm serving as a national president and I'm able to do some things and help people and feel the difference that we're making. Just in Washington, our, our united voice. Just look at the you know, Commission on Law Enforcement uh, that was just put together and the ability to be able to help, you know, to name people on that commission and collectively assign people to work in those working groups to do just what we talked about. Sit across the table with the stakeholders and have this discussion on how we can do some meaningful reform for our profession. Yeah, this is, there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole lot of things that I can say I'm proud of. Officer wellness, you know, we created an officer wellness uh, division. You know, I want you to think about it, you know, officer, you know, average person might witness three, two, three uh, uh, critical incidents in their lifetime. A critical incident will take a toll on you both mentally and physically. And think about it, every law enforcement who went, officer who went on the job did two things before they went on the job. They got a psychiatric, psych, uh, psychological evaluation and they got a physical evaluation and they were fit and they were sound. But then we go a few years down the road and it doesn't take long before we start seeing that the health, both mentally and physically, of people in law enforcement is not in the same level in people in their own age bands across this country. Why, why is that? It's because the average person who witnesses those three, maybe in a lifetime, Incidents, critical incidents, that officer might see that in six months. He might see it in two months. He might see it in one week. And tell me that doesn't take a toll on a person's life. So when, when we see officers who say that's just a bad officer and they, they do some things that seem to be a little erratic, not once do we ever stop and say, you know what, we broke this person, we need to fix it. No, we said, you know what, he's a problem employee and let's move him out. And the public's real quick to say, hey, let's push him aside. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to protect bad officers. What, what I am saying is, is when you see these things, there's a reason. When someone is broken in the service of others, we have a, a moral and a fiduciary responsibility to fix that which has been broken in the service of our communities.
Well, I'm going to go back to the first guy who told me I had to go to a meeting. Didn't give me a choice. His name was Richard Benoit, a uh, dear friend of mine for years. Uh, he passed a few years back, but I always uh, had just tremendous respect for his advice and counsel. Uh, there were quite a few on my state level as well uh, that, uh, that just over the years helped me sort of be in a position I've gotten, you know, gotten to, Charlie Carter, Willie, Willie Patton, uh, Johnny Frederick. There's just a, a few people that have been you know, just there for me this whole time and kind of helped me, uh, and many more uh, who kind of helped me get to where I am. Uh, Tommy Tizard, but, uh, and then when I got on the national level, there are quite a few, but I, I, there's, there's one that I, I admire, uh, Dick Boyd. Uh, he's just been just, he's just a very constant person. The first day I met him to the day he is now, he loves the FOP. I recognize the sacrifice that he has given over the years. Uh, he, he moved into this position to much uh, at, a, at, a, at a young age and found himself progressing to a point where, you know, I think most people work towards a certain retirement and they know where they need to be, but his uh, maybe been necessitated from... Uh, from becoming national president. So I recognize the sacrifice him and his family had made, not just in time, but also if you look at the long term on his pension uh, and when he, you know, his departure from, from law enforcement. I think all of that, I look at, I look at the tolls that it took on him, yeah, I had tremendous respect. Never, uh, never once have I called him and asked for advice that he didn't give me what I thought was the most sound. It wasn't always what I wanted to hear, but I always knew what he was doing was telling me from his heart what he thought was right. I want to tell them that I think we need to, to take a good look within. I think we need to look at the fact that, that it's easy. Look, I've been in this profession for a long time. I, I've seen the degradation uh, that we've seen from, from the way people look at us. And it's real hard for us to, to, to kind of really dig our heels in and say, you know, we're not going to take this anymore. And we like to see, you know, like to see that conflict. We like to see us fighting back. And look, we do need to fight back. You look at, you look at the initiatives we put in. We are, we, you know, we, we have really elevated our voice in giving fact-based information about what really is happening and not letting, letting the rhetoric take over. So, so for me, what I would like for them to, to recognize is, is that we need to empower people with facts. Somebody needs to speak up for us, and we're going to speak up for us, but you know what? We need to speak up for us in a very constructive way. That constructive way is, is this is why something happened, but let's talk about ways that we as a profession I think we need to look within and we need to find some ways to be able to build and improve our communities across this country. Because when we are partners in making that happen, then I think everything else from our collective bargaining to, to just our community support, everything all goes back to our ability to be able to connect with our communities. In our pay, in our stability, in our profession, everything's going to relate back to that one thing. And it all goes back to what I told you before. End of the day, it's not the service we provide, not that it's not important. Not the products we provide, not that it's not important. It really all comes down to relationships we build around all of these. Well, I, uh, before I got on the national board, I was part of the education committee. And uh, it, it was kind of an interesting story of how it came to be. Uh, the then president, uh, um, Steve Young, I was on a previous committee, chairman of a committee, and he, he called me in. He says, look, I, got some, I just want to talk to you. I'm not going to put you back chairman of that committee. It was a program development committee. And I was a little, a little distraught. So, man, I thought I was doing a good job. You know, I didn't, nobody said anything. I just, you know, finding my way through it. But, but if I was doing something wrong, man, tell me. I, you know, I could have fixed it. And he says, no. He says, I got something different. I want you to be the chairman of the education committee. And he gave me some, some pretty, pretty good information. He said, look, he says, I'm not telling you what I expect. Uh, other than I expect you to give me something completely different than we have now, I want you to think a little differently and, and let's, let's see if we can't increase our education program. And uh, so I did that. I kind of thought a little bit different than what we had. We had a secretary and treasurer's training uh, in Nashville every year. So you know what? We teach the secretaries how to do the books. We teach uh, uh, secretaries how to, how to do the uh, secretary work, the administrative functions. We're teaching the uh, secretary, uh, the treasurers how to do the treasurer's work. What about all of the other officers, all, all the other potential officers? You know, maybe the people who need the help the most are the ones that are least likely to help themselves. We ought to be, we ought to be teaching everybody across the board what they need in order to be successful. They're running a business. And so we created what we call Leadership Matters. It's our best training uh, event that we have every year. It sells out every year, and it's a very powerful 
two, three day training and that uh, it, we do our job right. We're empowering people with the tools to be successful. We're, we're elevating their energy level and their excitement. And we send them back and they do some great things. So uh, yeah, I'm very proud of, of that committee in a short period of time that I had it because once I became a national board member, which was not, not long after that, then I had to give the committee up. But that brief period I was there, we, we, we instituted a, so a lot of changes in the way we do education and to, to the, uh, and, and to much to the credit of Steve Young, who said, you know what, I know what we're doing now, and I know that this is missed not hitting the mark. I want to see something pl completely different, and I want you to, to, to not let me down. And uh, I'd like to think, you know, his untimely death, you know, was, uh, was a shocker to all of us, but I'd like to think that he was proud of what we, what we accomplished in that committee. You know, that was me. That was me 35 years ago. I never had an aspiration to be on a national board, much less be the national president. I would go to the conferences and I would say, wow, that's, uh, that's, those, that's those big cities. They always run this thing. You know, they're in charge of everything. I'd go to conferences and never really felt like I was part of it because I felt like it was driven by, uh, by the big cities who, who drowned out everybody. It took me a little while to figure it out, um, but I'm from a small state. We got 6,000 members in our state. You know, it's, it's a, it, pales, it pales in comparison to others. I was from a small lodge. When I first went into my lodge, we had 100 members. You know, we're much larger now, but the point I'm making is, is that I don't think the size, I don't think the size made a difference. The size of the state or the size of the lodge made a difference. I think it's what's in your heart. And so when you walk in that room and you don't, you don't think something's right, then, you know, you get the FOP you deserve. If you don't like the way things are running, change it. You have the ability to do it. And I always you know, tell people, take your membership card, open it out, look at it. I could give you mine. I'm the national president. My card has the same weight and looks the same way as yours does. Mine says I'm a member of St. Charles Lodge 15, and because of that, I can be the national president. So everything starts local. And uh, so if I wasn't a member of St. Charles Lodge 15, then I would be the national president. So, you know, if you, you're asking, you know, what's somebody's aspirations that they want to make it, let me tell you, you want to make it, there's nothing holding you back. You don't inherit this job, you earn it. And if you want it, then go get it.